It's good to see everyone tonight. Thank everybody for making it out to our midweek assembly. As you can see up on the PowerPoint, we'll be continuing the study I've been engaging in as I've had opportunities to teach on Wednesday nights here and there. And that is to go book by book through the Bible, just providing some simple and basic overviews of the various books. We started at the very beginning. We've covered now Genesis through Joshua. So now we come to the book of Judges. The book of Judges is a very interesting book. I remember as a uh, young boy, I always enjoyed the book of Judges or hearing about the book of Judges because it's a very action-packed book. There's interesting men and women that are recorded, some of which almost seem like superheroes, like the man Samson. But then, of course, you have some other very famous judges like Gideon or Deborah and some of the others. And so, in some ways, it's a very intriguing book, and it's an interesting book. But then, as you grow up a little bit and look at the book of Judges, you begin to realize that while it may be interesting and it may be action-packed, it's one of those books that has a great deal of darkness within it. It's a book of tragedy. It's a book uh, of failure in many regards. Now, there are some good lessons within it, and there's some hopeful lessons within it, but there's a lot of warning, a lot of negative lessons that we should learn from in the book of Judges. Now, we're not going to spend our time tonight going into all the various stories. Many of the judges could be lessons in and of themselves or multiple lessons. And so I'm actually not going to spend much time on the judges themselves tonight. But as we've done with the other books, we're just going to overview and review the book. And I hope that that gives you the foundation, if needed, to go and do some further study and reading or equips you to read through the book and maybe understand it in more detail as you have a greater picture of the overarching book and its themes in general. And so we'll start the way we've done most of our studies. We'll talk about the book's title. Now, it's called the Book of Judges, and it is called that because that's the name that's been given to it, and that comes from the main characters that we find within the book. There are several men or women that we will find that are called judges. Now, when we think about a judge in our country, a judge is someone who is a judiciary. They sit and they uh, oversee legal proceedings, and they make determinations in legal and judicial matters. They have nothing to do with the military. They have nothing to do even with legislating or ruling. They simply decide legal cases. That's what a judge is to us. But when the Bible, in the book of Judges, these men and women, they were not judicial um, judges or legal judges, so to speak. There may have been some aspect of that in some of their rulership, but they were military leaders and military deliverers. So they weren't judges in the way that we think of, but they were individuals that God raised up and empowered in some way or supported in various ways to have these people lead the nation or groups of the nation against whatever oppressing force Israel was facing at the time. And so they really became military heroes. And then they would usually practice some form of rule. They weren't kings, and so to speak, but they would sort of rule over the people for a while until they died. And the book tells us, the book of Judges tells us about 13 such individuals that were judges. Now, as for the author of the book, there is no authorship claim. Nobody, there's no one named in the book or in other places of the Bible that tells us who wrote the book of Judges. And so really, it is an anonymous book. But there are some things that give us some clues as to when the book was written, and that may help us come up with an educated guess. Uh, for one thing, and we'll come back to this because it's an important theme that's found later or throughout the book, uh, it says multiple times somewhere in the book of Judges, in those days there was no king over Israel. Now that phrase makes you think that when somebody wrote this book, that there was a king in Israel. It wouldn't make much sense to write to a country, you know, write during the period of the Judges, I'd say in those days there was no king in Israel, just like there's no king in Israel today. This seems to have been written at some point after the kingdom era or the monarchy era began. And so it was probably written sometime after uh, Saul became king. In chapter 1 verse 21, 
The book tells us that the Jebusites have lived with the people of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. Now, somewhere around the eighth year of David's reign, he came up against the city of Jerusalem and he threw out, he conquered the city of Jerusalem. During Saul's reign, Jerusalem was not really a conquered city. The Jebusites inhabited that city. And it wasn't until David, and again, it was about eight years into his kingdom, his reign, that he conquered the city of Jerusalem. Now, there are some verses that seem to indicate some of the Jebusites may have continued to live in Jerusalem. But that seems to me, chapter 1, verse 21, to indicate that this was probably written before David had made Jerusalem his capital before David had become had settled, settled there in Jerusalem and for all intents and purposes uh, cast out the Jebusites. And then in chapter 18, it speaks of, uh, and we'll talk about this story a little bit later, but speaking about the tribe of Dan and some of their idolatry, it mentions that they partook in a certain form of idolatry until the captivity of the land and as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. Now, some commentators believe that that until the captivity of the land refers to the Babylonian captivity, which would make the book of Judges not written until hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years after the events, and it would be a post-exilic book that was written, which that would mean someone uh, like Ezra or Nehemiah, perhaps. But with it also saying that this happened as long as the house of God was at Shiloh, it seems like the captivity that is mentioned in chapter 18 verse 30 is probably not the Babylonian captivity. Because again, the house of God was at Shiloh until David's reign when he brought the Ark of the Covenant back down into Jerusalem. And then of course under his son's reign, Solomon, the temple was built. And so it seems earlier than the Babylonian captivity. But all of these things taken together, it seems most likely that the book of Judges was written sometime during the reign of Saul or maybe early during the reign of King David. Now, of all the individuals that we know of, the most likely author at that point would have been Samuel. We know that Samuel was the author of some other books and traditionally in the Jewish tradition has given him authorship of several books of the Old Testament, including the book of Judges. And that seems to be the most likely candidate, but it's also possible that some of the other individuals named in the Judges wrote down portions of it and it was compiled by someone like Samuel. We don't know for sure who wrote it, but it seems it was written fairly shortly after the events that are recorded. Now as for the time frame and the timeline that's covered, basically the book of Judges we can think of as occurring between the time of Joshua and the conquest and King Saul in the beginning of the monarchy. Now exactly how long that was is difficult to determine. See, if we just add up all of the years that are mentioned of the judges, it says that they ruled for so many years and then there was a captivity for so many years. If you just add all of those up, I think you come to 390 years if all of those are exactly chronological. But it may not be exactly chronological. It may not be 40 years of captivity, then 20 years of a ruler, then a new... See, all what we'll see this in the geography here in just a moment. These judges were in different parts of the land of Israel. And there were different enemies that are said to have attacked from all around. And being as this was regional, some of these judges may have actually overlapped in their time frame. And so as we read the stories, while we have a tendency to read chronologically, it's very possible that we're reading about events that are taking place at the same time as some of the other events that we read in the book of Judges. For example, there may be something taking place in the southern portion of Israel while something else is taking place in northern Israel. And so if you do that, then the period of the Judges could potentially be even as short as 150 years. But somewhere between 150 and 350 years is probably the time frame that's taken up in the book of Judges. And again, that is between the conquest of the land of Canaan and Joshua's leadership and the rise of Samuel and Saul and the beginning 
of the monarchy. Now I mentioned the geography of where things take place. Everything in the book of Judges, of course, takes place in the land of Canaan, which is now the land of of Israel. And I know this is kind of small, so you probably can't see this, but these little white boxes have the names of all of the judges of Israel. And so what you see is every region that's uh, inhabited by the Israelites finds itself in the story of the book of Judges. Now, that also tells us that every single region was plagued by the same problems or similar problems. There was no region that just stood out throughout the time of the judges as always faithful and as always uh, committed to serving the Lord and following His ways. Every single region ended up going off into some type of apostasy or idolatry and thus facing oppression and thus needing a judge to be risen by the Lord to save the people. And so all of this takes place here in Israel. Here's the location of some of the enemies that we'll read about. We'll read about the Ammonites in the book of Judges. The Moabites, uh, the Moabites are down to the southeast of Israel. And then the Philistines. Philistia takes up this southwestern uh, shore by the Mediterranean Sea. And then there's some others that are mentioned. But those are some of the main ones. And so as we go through that. We come and let's consider some of the themes. Why is the book of Judges important? What is the purpose of this book? Well, it is, of course, at first, it is to record Israel's history. As with all of the historical books, as we call them, and that, go, that is Joshua through Second Chronicles, there's 12 books that tell us the history of Israel. Now, it tells us some, ver some historical information, but of course, it's a history that is theologically centered and theologically motivated. It's telling us not just historical facts for the sake of historical facts, but it's telling us the history of God's people. It's showing us God's redemptive plan through history, and he's using the nation of Israel to fulfill his promises that he made back in the garden, the promises he made to Abraham, promises that are looking forward to a Messiah. And so as we're working through the Old Testament towards the fulfillment of God's promises, we're learning how everything took place. And we're learning how God used this people, how he shaped this people, how he worked with this people, and how even despite great odds, and a lot of rebellion, God was still able to fulfill his promises. And so this is a portion, just one portion, of the history of Israel. But as we read the book of Judges, there are some specific lessons that it teaches us. And one is that it highlights the consequences of disobedience. Over and over again, and we'll see this cycle here in just a little while, the nation of Israel, or groups within the nation of Israel, committed idolatry and immorality and left the faith of the Mosaic Law. Now, if you remember from our overviews of those books, in the law, in Leviticus, in Deuteronomy, and even in Joshua, when they were conquering the land and they went and read these things, God had provided blessings and cursings. God had promised in the law that if the people would obey Him, if they would obey and observe the law, that they would be blessed. Things would go well with them in the land of Canaan. They would live long in the land and things would be pleasant and good for them. He would bless them. But if they were disobedient, if they rebelled against his law, if they didn't follow his law, if they uh, went and sought after the foreign gods of other nations, God wasn't going to just turn a blind eye to that. He may be patient with them. He may give them some time. But if they persisted in that... God had promised that he would punish them. He would send famines. He would send oppressors. He would send problems to chastise the people, to show his displeasure, and to bring them back to him if they would listen to those corrections. And that's exactly what happens again and again and again throughout the book of Judges. It's a great reminder of God's anger and the punishment that sin brings about when we refuse to follow him. It also reveals the danger of improper leadership. I already mentioned this before, and we'll come back to this at the last section. But over and over again, the book of Judges says, in that day, or in those days, there was no king in Israel. Now, that may be written, again, from Samuel's perspective, who's living under the reign of Saul, or living under the reign of David at the end, and a very pro-kingdom era at that point. But it's a reminder that at this time, Israel was not 
did not follow good leaders. They didn't have good leaders. In fact, one of the sad things is even these judges that were raised up, they allowed for deliverance of the people. But a lot of the judges themselves were not good people. I think of Samson. Samson came around in the very, very end, but Samson wasn't a good man. In fact, Samson was a pretty immoral man, an evil man in some ways. God was still able to use him, and he was able to turn things around by the end. But Samson had a lot of problems. Gideon had some problems. Many of the individuals we'll read about had problems, and these were the best leaders that Israel seemed to have during these days. And so it's no wonder that Israel plummets into what you might call the dark ages of Israel's history because they have no leadership. They have no good leadership. And that's such a different picture, such a contrast to the book we just reviewed last time, the book of Joshua. Now, Joshua was a great leader. And under Joshua's faithful leadership, and with a nation that was willing to follow that leadership, we, you might recall that in the book of Joshua, it was a book of success, a book of victory, a book of dominance for the Hebrew people. But then you turn the page and come to the book of Judges, and Joshua has died, and the generation of elders that lived with Joshua has died, and the nation plummets into apostasy and idolatry and all sorts of problems. So this book reveals the importance of good godly leadership. And while those are some kind of negative things, the book does also demonstrate God's love and God's willingness to forgive. As I mentioned over and over and over again, the people of Israel sin. They commit immor immorality or idolatry, thus bringing about consequences for their disobedience. But something else happens over and over again. After they've suffered for a while, and they've sobered up, and they've realized the problems in their lives, and they've realized that the reason they're suffering is because they had left the Lord's ways. The people would cry out to God, much like when they were slaves in Egypt. Do you know what always happens? God always hears them. Over and over and over again. Far past the point of any human patience for sure. God still listened to the people. And he still took pity on them when they were ready to return. And even after they no longer deserved it. After they had deserved to just be left to whatever fate might befall them. God would, could reach down again. And he would raise up some deliverer to save them. And to help them. And so in all the darkness of the book of Judges. There is a beautiful picture of God's willingness. And his desire to forgive. When his children are ready to turn and repent. So the outline of the book of Judges. Just to kind of get uh, an overview of how the book falls into place. There's really three main sections. There's the introduction, which is covered in the first two chapters, in the first few verses of chapter 6. And then the main heart of the book, what we really think of when we think of the book of Judges, is found from verse, chapter 3, verse 7, through the end of chapter 16. This is the section that records all of the different judges. Some of them are only mentioned briefly. Some of them, like Samson, have several chapters dedicated to their life and to their rule. And then the final few chapters, chapter 17 through 21, are uh, they, they are the condition of the nation. And we'll get to that section here in just a moment. But that's the outline of the book of Judges. Now, so let's talk about this introduction for just a moment. As we open up the book of Judges and we read through the first couple of chapters, Chapter 1 is the transition from the book of Joshua, which has recorded the conquest, the allotment of the land, into the time period of the judges. And one of the things that we find is that the conquest was not fully complete. Under Joshua's reign and leadership, they were able to defeat huge sections of the land of Canaan. They were able to destroy several kings. They were able to wipe out the inhabitants enough that Israel was able to then go in and inhabit the land. But there were still many peoples and uh, groups that were left. And it was the responsibility of each of the tribes to then go and complete the conquest. 
they didn't have all the work done yet. Now, they were, they were supposed to be small enough and isolated enough groups that any of the tribes should have been able to go to their allotted territory and finish the conquest. But the problem is, they didn't do that. For so, You can imagine why. They've been in the wilderness for decades. They've spent several years now warring with this nation of, or these nations within Canaan. And so when the people get their reward and their inheritance... It seems like they decided to just start enjoying that inheritance. And they weren't faithful and zealous about continuing the conquest of the land. Especially after Joshua's death. They left so many of the peoples in place. And you can read there in chapter 2 where it names many of those nations. And it also gives us a clue as to one of the problems. Not only did they allow these people to remain, but they began to intermingle with them. The book says in chapter 2 that they began to give their daughters in marriage to these Hivites and Canaanites and all of these other people that they left in the land. They began to take their daughters, uh, their women in marriage for their sons. And so they began intermingling with these people. And what did that lead to? Well, again and again and again, it led to idolatry. They became influenced by the people that they were supposed to drive out. Now that's a Great lesson in and of itself not to over-allegorize the story of Judges. And it's not that we're supposed to go through our life killing all those that are opposed to us. We're not given the mandates that the Israelites were to purge the land. But there are evil influences all around us. And sometimes what we need to do is get those evil influences out of our life. Again, we don't do that through physical means and forceful means or violent means. But sometimes we have to flee from situations. Sometimes we have to make choices to make sure we're not in situations. Maybe we have to change jobs or careers because of the temptations that are posed to us. Whatever it may be, sometimes in our lives we have evil influences. And we need to purge those things out. And the reason we need to purge them out is because the longer we go without doing that, the more influence they will have over us. And just like these people who had just been led through the miracles of the deliverance from Egypt. They'd seen God's hand in the wilderness. They followed Joshua in the conquest of the land. And then it only took about a generation for them to be influenced by the heathen and idolatrous people of the land. They should have influenced for good, but that just doesn't happen very often. The longer that we allow evil influences to wield their power upon us, the more likely it is that we'll give in to those evil influences. And chapter 2 provides kind of a summary of what the rest of the book is going to be like, and it describes what we might call the judge's cycle. What would happen, and this cycle repeats over and over and over again throughout the book of Judges, there would be a period of disobedience. The people would go off and follow some foreign god or begin committing some form of idolatry. God would allow that for only so long before he would send a chastisement in the form of an oppressor. Maybe the Moabites or maybe the Ammonites or of course there's the Philistines. And God would use these foreign nations, much like he would later use Assyria or Babylon, to oppress the people. And they would make life hard for the people. And sometimes it would take a while, sometimes even a couple of decades. And the people would realize the reason they were suffering was because of their disobedience. And so they would repent and they would turn to God. And he would rise up a deliverer. He would bring about a, milit a judge that would throw off the yoke of oppression, who would deliver the children of Israel. And for a while, while that judge lived, there would be peace. But then that judge would die. And the people would repeat the cycle over again. And this cycle finds itself again and again and again throughout the book of Judges. And so that brings us to the main section of the book, which actually we're going to spend not very much time on. Um, but the period of the Judges, chapter 3 through 16, gives us the accounts of all of the judges. Now some of these are very well known. You know, we've probably heard many sermons about Gideon or Deborah and Barak and Samson. Samson's probably the most famous of the judges. But some of them we have a great deal of information about. In Samson, we know where he lived. We know where he was from. We know the circumstances of his birth. We know many of the details that occurred during his time as a judge. And then some of the uh, judges 
we know nothing about other than maybe how long that they uh, were a judge for. You know, we've got people like Shamgar who apparently helped with the Philistines, but we don't know how many years uh, there were of peace or of oppression. We don't even know which tribes were involved. And then others we know a great deal of information. But there's 12 cycles here. There's 13 judges because we've got Deborah and Barak both. So there's 13 individuals that were told about during the time period of the judges. And again, this repeats that cycle again and again. Now, there's a lot of great stories here. But if I get into the stories, then that will take up all of our time. And that's not the purpose of our lesson. Uh, again, we're just overviewing things. So I leave it to you to go and read of some of these men and women and the great feats that they accomplished, the great ways that God worked through these individuals in order to deliver his people. And there are great messages there. God's ability to save his people, sometimes in the most extraordinary of ways, sometimes using the most unlikely of individuals. And yet God is always able to bring about deliverance for his people. Well, then there is the last and final section of the book of Judges, chapter 17 through 21. And this is kind of an addendum, so to speak, that portrays and shows the condition of the nation. Now, again, we read things chronologically so often that we may think when we get through the chapter 16 and we've read about Samson, that then it's starting to tell us some stories that take place after Samson. But I think what we have in the two primary stories that are told in these chapters is two case studies, so to speak. They are two of the primary examples of what was taking place in Israel during the period of the Judges. First of all, there is a story of idolatry. In chapter 17 through 18, we meet a man named Micah. Now, he is from the tribe of Ephraim. He is an Ephraimite. And for some reason, this man decides that he wants to make his own gods. And so he makes his own household gods. He has some nice little idols. He makes an ephod, which was a garment that a priest was supposed to wear. And he sets up his son as a priest. Now you can see all of the problems with this situation. This is a direct contradiction of the law of Moses. His son is not a Levite, so he can't be a priest anyway. There's graven and carved images. They're just making up their own religion. But what's interesting is people usually know that there's aspects of truth that they're not following. And so one day there's a priest who is traveling through and he's a Levite. So he is a priest. And this man thinks, oh boy, this I have a chance here to actually have a real priest. He knew his son was a sham. He knew the whole thing was a sham, really. But he decides to hire this Levite. So he tells him he'll take care of him. He'll pay him wages and feed him. And the Levite thinks this sounds like a pretty good deal. So he goes to Micah's home and he becomes the family priest. Now that's pretty sad for a Levite. And we're going to have a little bit more to say about who this Levite is. It's very sad that he would fall this far. But anyway, he's there serving as the household priest. And during this time, the tribe of Dan was actually located kind of in the southern part of the land of Canaan. But they decide to go somewhere else. And so they send a scouting party of spies up north to find an area that they might conquer. And as they're traveling, they stop in Ephraim and they, these spies end up staying with Micah. And while they're there, they end up not just spying out the land, but they see Micah's got these nice little idols and he's got this ephod and he's got his own Levitical priest. And so when they go back home after scouting out the north and they tell the tribe about all the land that's unprotected that they can take up there, they say, and by the way, there's this man who has these household gods, and they have, he has a Levite priest. And so on the way back through, they stop in Ephraim. And they go and they convince this Levite to come with them. They say, wouldn't it be better for you to be a priest over an entire tribe instead of just a family? And the Levite, greedy as he was, thought that sounded pretty good. That was quite the promotion. Of course, Micah, they also steal his gods. Micah's uh, beyond flustered by this, he wakes up one day to find his household gods gone, and his priest gone, and he chases after the tribe of Dan. And when he arrives and makes his complaint, they basically tell him, well, you should probably be quiet unless some angry people just by chance happen to fall upon you and something bad happens. Now, these are Israelites. These are brethren. And they're getting ready to attack this man and kill him if he doesn't shut up and just go back home. 
You can see the depravity of the nation at this point. And so Dan continues north. They've stolen the idols. They've convinced the Levite to come and be their priest. And that's where we read earlier in chapter 18. They followed that idolatrous way pretty much throughout the entire period of the judges. Now here's an interesting fact. Who was that Levite? Was he just a nobody Levite? Well, in Judges 18 verse 30, it says, The people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Moses, and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. Now, if you're reading the New King James, that's the English standard. If you're reading the New King James or the Old King James, that will probably say uh, Jonathan, the son of Gershom, son of Manasseh. And there is a variant there in some of the Hebrew manuscripts. manuscripts. And what most commentators think is that at some point in the past, this is a case where sometimes some things happened that shouldn't have happened. It may have been that some scribes didn't think it was appropriate to name Moses as the grandfather of a man engrossed in such idolatry, and it was changed to Manasseh. But many manuscripts show that it was Moses, and if you look back at the family tree, Moses had a son named Gershom. And so it seems very likely, in fact, it's almost certain, that this Levite that we're reading about in Judges is none other than the grandson of Moses. The grandson of of the greatest leader in all of the Old Testament has become nothing more than a priest for hire willing to commit idolatry and willing to simply go wherever the money will lead him. That's how quickly things can happen. That's how quickly things can devolve. And that's how quickly things did devolve in the nation of Israel during this time. But then there's another story. In my opinion, perhaps... These are the darkest chapters in all of the Bible, one of the most disturbing stories that you can read about. There's a story of a, of a Levite, another Levite, who's unnamed, and his concubine. Now right there you see a situation that is not what it should be. We have a Levite who has a concubine who's not a legitimate wife. But not only that, but he has a concubine who, who is unfaithful to him. All of her unfaithfulness is not disclosed, but at some point she leaves him and she goes back to her father's home. And he lets her go there for <coughs> a few months. But then he decides he wants his concubine back. And so this Levite travels there and he plans on speaking kind words to her, the Bible says, and convincing her to come back home with him. And so he goes and he's able to do that. And they begin their trek back home. And on the way home, they stop in a city of Gibeah. Now Gibeah was in the tribe of Benjamin. And we see a scene that shocks or should shock any child of God. Because again, this is God's people. And you read the scene, and basically what unfolds is a replica of another story in the Bible. The story we read about back in Genesis, in the midst of Sodom and Gomorrah. This man and his concubine are taken in to an, uh, a man's home. He knows that they're in danger, and so he brings them in. And before long, as nightfall happens, the city gathers around this house, and we're told that the men of the city began banging on the door and making the same command or same demand that Sodom and Gomorrah had so long ago when the angels were taken into Lot's home. The men gathered, demanding that the man, the Levite, be thrown out to them so that they might know him carnally, that they might abuse him and rape him. Well, the man that knows that this is a vile thing, and he pleads with the people, he even offers his own daughter and the concubine, but the people won't hear of it. They don't want that. But then the Levite just takes things into his own hands and to try and save his skin. He opens the door and shoves his concubine out. And we're told that the men of the city violated her all throughout the night. And then they finally stop as the dawn begins to break. And she's barely alive and she crawls to the door. And there she dies on the threshold of the house. The Levite wakes up, apparently having had a good night of sleep, and opens the door and sees her lying there. And the Bible says he just tells her, let's be going. And of course she doesn't move, and he realizes that his concubine has been killed. Well, this angers him. So he returns home, he takes the corpse with him, and he, t he ends up cutting the corpse into 12 different pieces. He cuts off the limbs into 12 pieces. And he sends the pieces of his concubine's body, one piece to every tribe in Israel, explaining what has happened. Now the man's mad. Now the man's wrathful. 
And the man should be. What happened to this woman was a disgusting thing. But he allowed it to happen. It's such a picture of the world that gets so mad when evil is done to them. Even though they allow evil to, be, to take place all around them. Or they themselves take part in evil. And that's exactly what had happened here. But the rest of the nation is incensed. Even they are able to tell that this is a terrible thing that's happened in Gibeah. And all of Israel marches upon the city. But one of the other turns that's just amazing is when they get there and they basically beseech the tribe of Benjamin to give up the men of this city for punishment, Benjamin won't do it. They protect the men. They're willing to allow these men to continue and to live despite their heinous crimes. And so civil war breaks out and Benjamin's able to hold its own for a while and thousands and thousands of men and soldiers are killed. But in the end, the rest of Israel prevails. And the tribe of Benjamin is decimated and almost entirely extinguished. And chapter 21 explains how the tribe is barely saved. There's some pretty unethical situations and choices, I would argue. But they try and find a way to marry some people off to the tribe of Benjamin so that the entire tribe doesn't end up lost to history. Well, those, like I said, are some very dark chapters, but they teach us some important lessons. First, they teach us the plague of idolatry and immorality. And those two things go hand in hand so frequently. Now, in our world, we may not think that idolatry exists, but it certainly does. There are so many ways that people put things before God or things that people worship instead of God. A Psalm 24 Verses 3 and 4 says, Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord, or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, a moral person, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, or sworn deceitfully. These pictures, as disturbing and uncomfortable as they are to read, paint the exact picture of the depths of depravity that idolatry and immorality can and do lead to. They show how disgusting idolatry and immorality really are. And they should be a grave warning for all of God's children to avoid idolatry and immorality at all costs. These lessons also teach us the need for leadership. It is within these chapters that we find all four of the uh, statements, there was no king in Israel. What does no leadership bring about? Is that all that bad of a situation? I know sometimes we think, oh, things are okay if we don't have leaders. We don't really need to have leaders. Reread Judges 17 through 21 and read that emphasis. There was no king. When there is no leadership, disaster looms. And this is also a passage or a section that reminds us man's need for God's direction. Not just leadership, but for God. Judges, Judges 21 verse 25, the last verse of the book says in those days there was no king in Israel everyone did what was right in his own eyes that's the synopsis of Judges right there that sums up the book of Judges everyone did what was right in his own eyes and again the judges weren't immune Samson did what was right in his own eyes. Many of the judges did and this is why the period of the judges is such a terrible dark defeating era of Hebrew history because people led themselves instead of being led by God. Jeremiah 10 and 23 says, I know, O Lord, that the way of man is not in himself, that it is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Humanity has always struggled with this. Humanity has always wanted to chart his own course and make our own way. And our country and our culture is no different. We prize freedom so much. We prize right of choice so much. We prize independence so much that we want to be the king. We don't want anybody telling us what to do. And to be honest, that includes God for most people. We want to do what is right in our own eyes. And if we ever begin thinking that way, we need only to reread re Judges, so even just the final few verses. And be reminded that when mankind does what is right in his eyes, he will inevitably do what is wrong in God's eyes. And so we must always turn our eyes to the word of God, humble our hearts before it, and follow the Lord faithfully and humbly and obediently.
lest we go down the same dark road in various ways that the Israelites did during the period of the judges. Well, we'll bring our study to a close there. I hope that this overview has maybe helped you understand the book of Judges in a broad and in a big sense, maybe encouraged you to go and read some of these things for yourselves. And I hope the study has been beneficial and helpful. As we normally do, we'll extend the invitation. Perhaps there's somebody here who's not a child of God. And if that's the case, you have the opportunity to become a child of God by obeying the gospel. If you believe in Christ, Jesus is the Christ, are ready to repent of your sins and confess Jesus is the Son of God, then you need to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or if there's a Christian here who desires the prayers of the church, then we'd be happy to pray with you and for you. So if there be one in need, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.